Aren't you glad, aren't you glad that God never moves, that he's always present, that he never leaves us, he never forsakes us. 
Uh, are you glad to be here today? Amen. Amen. I, I am. Uh, I'm glad. We have had a great week this week. Uh, first thing is we, we had three new babies born into the church family this week. Uh, Change Canop has, was born this week, ABC. Uh, I told, you know, we've been telling Glenn for, for weeks, you know, we don't know if it's a boy or a girl, we don't know what it is, but we know one thing. We're going to call him Change because can't Change has come to the house. But uh, we had three babies born. We had our wild game uh, dinner on Thursday night. Uh, sold it out, had a waiting list to get in, uh, had a great crowd, great food. We had 12 professions of faith on Thursday night. We had six people rededicate their life to Christ. And so uh, that's what it was all about. And so great success. Thank you for everybody that worked. Uh, listen, our folks showed up and they worked like Trojans. Uh, Janice and uh, her crowd got started around Monday, starting to get the room ready. And uh, by Wednesday afternoon, that was done. But people just rolled in here and did whatever needed to be done. And so uh, if you were a part of that, thank you for, for coming and doing that. Also, today is a special day in the Stokes household. In the Stokes, Mac and Judy Stokes, 50 years today. Love you. Well, if you're a guest, we're glad that you're here. We're going to stand up right now, turn around, and find somebody you haven't spoken to and welcome them.
great God today. We give you our worship and praise, Lord. Thank you for your presence here. Move among us, we pray. Water you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine.
And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Let's be seated together. If you brought your Bible, uh, find Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27 is uh, where we'll get started this morning. And um, I want to speak to you today on the subject, proof. You know, some often in, in, in the world that we're living in, people are looking for proof. They're looking for hard facts. Uh, they're not so much interested in, in legend. Uh, they're not so much interested in theory. They want concrete, hard facts whenever they're searching for something. Well, it, it's no different when you talk about Jesus, the Son of God. Uh, the world we live in, there's a lot of speculation, a lot of scrutiny. I mean, was he the Son of God or was he not the Son of God? Well, this morning what I want to do is I, I want to talk to you about the proof, the hard facts, the tangible results that Jesus is the Son of God. Scripture records a number of supernatural phenomena that occurred while Jesus hung on the, on the cross. And as you look at it, these phenomena are really God's supernatural commentary of cosmic importance. They gave proof that the execution taking place that day outside of Jerusalem's city walls was of cosmic importance. The roots of the city were jammed with pilgrims coming and going, preparing to celebrate Passover. Few, if any of them, realized what a mon monumental event was taking place on Calvary. Outside the city gates, outside the city wall, God's lamb, his paschal lamb, uh, was dying on that very Passover to provide forgiveness for all the sins of all the redeemed of all time. That was the very focal point of redemptive history. But yet as far as Jerusalem was concerned, very few even noticed. But then suddenly, all nature seemed to stop. Suddenly, all of nature seemed to pay attention to what was taking place. Suddenly, the sun was darkened at noonday. The first miraculous sign that accompanied the death of Christ. Matthew writes in Matthew 27, 45, Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell on all the land until the ninth hour. Now, the thing you've got to understand is Matthew was counting hours by the Jewish system. So the sixth hour would have been noontime. And so at the very moment when the sun should have been shining the brightest, darkness fell over all the land and remained for three hours. Now, there was probably not total darkness, but rather a severe darkening of the normal daylight intensity of the sun. The key phrase is over all the land. A lot of discussion, a lot of speculation. Some will say, no, it just fell over Jerusalem. That, that darkness fell over all the land of Jerusalem, all the land of Israel. I'm inclined to think that, that darkness fell over all of the land, all of the earth, where there was a moon shining at night, that it was darkened, and that as sun was shining in other places, the sun was darkened. As a matter of fact, according to some of the church fathers, the supernatural darkness that accompanied the crucifixion was noticed throughout all the world at that time. Tertullian mentioned this event in his Apologeticum, a defense of Christianity written to pagan skeptics. Listen to what he said. At the moment of Christ's death, the light departed from the sun, and the land was darkened at noonday, which wonder is related in your own annals, annals and is preserved in the, your archives to this day. You see the darkness. Some say, well, let, let me tell you what it was. It was, a, it was a solar eclipse. That's what happened. There was a solar eclipse. And, and that's why darkness fell over all the land. Well, that couldn't have been because Passover always fell on the full moon. And a solar eclipse, you know what that is, is caused when the moon gets between the earth and the sun, blocking the sun's light, would have been out of the question during the full moon. 
But God is certainly able to dim the light without the help of any kind of planetary phenomenon. Now think about it. You go back into the Old Testament and you remember that during Moses' time Mo, that, that darkness fell upon the land of Egypt because of the plague of locusts. It was so thick that they blocked out the light of the sun. In Joshua's time, the opposite occurred. Joshua and the army of Israel is fighting a battle. They're winning the battle, but they needed some more time. And so Joshua prayed to God and he said, Lord, make the sun stand still. And God made the sun to stand still. Also in Hezekiah's day, the shadows turned backward 10 degrees as the earth rotation seemed to reverse for about 40 minutes. And so the darkening of the sun is commonly mentioned in Scripture uh, of the last times. Amos wrote of the last days in Amos chapter 8. He says, I, it will come about in that day, declares the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. Throughout Scripture, darkness is associated with judgment. And supernatural darkness of this type signifies cataclysmic doom. So the darkness of the sun at noon was certain to evoke widespread fear. Certainly, those in the land feared that catastrophe was coming, that a cataclysmic judgment was about to fall. But in the case of Jesus' death, the darkness was a reminder that the cross was a place of judgment. In those awful hours of darkness, Christ was bearing the judgment meant for us. Christ was standing in our place. Christ was receiving the wrath of God. And it was being poured out on him for your sins and for mine. And that's why the, the biblical narrative links the culmination of the darkness with Jesus' outcry to the Father. In Matthew 27, 46, and it says, About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so Matthew tells us that when Jesus cried to God, that the crowd began to taunt him. And the taunting continued to the very end. And it was at some point in the midst of the taunting that, that Jesus cried out, I thirst, and, and they gave him a sour wine to drink. And shortly after that, he cried out to tell us that. It is finished. And so the sun was dark at noon. But secondly, the veil of the temple was torn. At the, at the moment of his death, there's a series of remarkable miracles that takes place. Matthew writes the first part in verse 51, And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now the veil of the temple was a heavy curtain, and it blocked the outer court from the holy of holies. Uh, it was a place where the Ark of the Covenant was stored, was kept. It symbolized the presence of God. Josephus, the historian, described the veil as an ornately decorated curtain made of woven fabric. And only one person was allowed to go behind the veil and that was the high priest. And he went into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement. And when he was permitted to enter to bring the blood of a sacrifice, and the veil was symbolic of importance. It signified that the Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way unto the holy place has not been disclosed. In other words, it was a constant reminder that sin made humanity unfit for the presence of God. You see, the fact that sin offering was offered annually was a constant reminder that the price had not been paid. Every year, people would bring their Passover lambs into the temple to have them sacrificed on Passover. Every year they were reminded that a sacrifice sufficient for their sins had not been made. Daily other sacrifices were made to show graphically that sin could not truly and permanently be erased by animal sacrifices. And in Hebrews chapter 10 we read this, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. 
And then in chapter 9, the writer of Hebrews says, But when God appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once and for all, having tamed eternal salvation. The tearing of the veil symbolized something. It symbolized that Jesus' sacrifice was a sufficient atonement. It symbolized that his sacrifice paid the price of sin forever. It signified that now all of a sudden, all men, all women would be given an opportunity to come unto Christ and that as an individual we can enter into the holy place ourselves. Aren't you glad you don't need a priest to pray through? Amen. Aren't you glad that somebody doesn't have to go and make atonement for your sin because somebody has made atonement for your sin as a man of God, Jesus Christ, Amen. the Son of God. And so the way of the Holy of Holies is open to everyone. And the Bible says it's torn from top to bottom. Significant. It's almost as if God reached down from heaven and supernaturally tore the temple the veil in the temple from God's side to man's side, signifying that whosoever will may come. Whosoever will may come. My son has removed the veil and eliminated the need for it. One of the things that we don't think about, the moment that the veil was torn, the temple was full of worshipers. Don't you know that was an exciting place to be that day? I mean, all of a sudden, outside, the sky goes dark. All of a sudden, a temple full of worshipers, they're there. Sacrifices are being made. Passover lambs are being sacrificed. And all of a sudden, this beautiful, ornate, heavy curtain rips from top to bottom. All of a sudden, for the first time, Common men are able to look into the holy place. All of a sudden, mankind can see the holy place of God. Jesus did that, the Son of God. You see, by God's design, it was in that very hour that thousands of lambs were being slain that the Passover lamb died. He was the lamb whom all others symbolized. In fact, he perfectly fulfilled all the symbolism for the worship in the temple. From that day, all the temple ceremonies have lost their significance. You know, in our world today, they, there are those who say, well, we need to rebuild the temple. We need to restart the sacrificial system. I mean, there's no need to restart a sacrificial system because God has sent the perfect lamb. There's no need for another animal to die, for another blood, animal's blood to be shared to try to cover our sins. John the Baptist said it, said it well. Behold the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. Aren't you glad that Jesus died for your sin? Aren't you glad that his sacrifice was sufficient to cover your sins? Aren't you glad that his sacrifice was pure enough, that it was holy enough to satisfy the requirement of God to pay the price for your sin? The sacrifices were meant to, everything that they were meant to accomplish had foreshadowed what had just arrived. And within 40 years, the temple would be destroyed when Titus came to Jerusalem. But the end of the Old Testament sacrificial system occurred not when the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. Someone said, oh, well, they stopped that in 70 A.D. when, when the legions marched in and, and the city was decimated and the temple was destroyed. That's when the sacrificial system came to place. No, it wasn't. Sacrificial came, came to an end the day that Jesus was nailed to a cross and shed his blood for you and me. That was God's exclamation point. And so the sun was dark. The temple veil was torn. 
Then the earth began to shake and the rocks split. Uh, look at the rest of verse number 51 in, in Matthew 27. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. An earthquake powerful enough to split rocks would be a significant tremor. And, and such a powerful earthquake would be a frightening experience for everyone in the region of Judea. And, and although earthquake quakes uh, were pretty common, uh, an earthquake with enough force to split rocks would have instantly brought the entire city to a screeching halt for several minutes. Earthquakes in Scripture are often used like darkness to signify a graphic display of divine judgment. In particular, earthquakes symbolize the wrath of God. When Moses went to meet with God at Sinai to receive the tablets, Exodus chapter 19 says, And the whole mountain quaked violently. David wrote in Psalms 18, Then the earth shook and it, and it quaked, and the foundations of the mountains were trembling and were shaken because he was angry. Psalm 68, And the earth quaked, and the heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself quaked at the presence of God, the God of Israel. And the book of Revelation indicates that the final judgment of the earth will commence with a global earthquake more powerful than anything that's ever been experienced. So it's clear that supernatural earthquakes like this could only signify, it, it signifies the wrath of God. God is pouring out everything he has in the moment. At the cross, God's wrath is poured out against sin that's being leveled on God's Son. And the accompanying earthquake coming at the culmination moment of Christ's atoning work was a kind of divine punctuation mark. Perhaps God signifying in His anger that, at the fact that, that sin had cost Him so much. Here's the thing. Since the cross, we've been under grace. And I'm so thankful for God's grace. Aren't you thankful for the grace of God? Amen. Uh, now, now, grace is not licensed to go and do what you want to do. Right. I've known people before that would just say, well, you know, I'm under grace, and because I'm under grace, I can kind of do what I want, live what I want, be what I want, because I'm under grace. I, I, I'm free. I'm free, preacher. I'm, I'm under grace. I'm not under the law anymore. Here's the thing. You've got to fully understand the grace of God. And the grace of God that has been lavished upon you and bestowed upon you and poured out upon you was not cheap grace. That's right. It cost God His Son. That's, right. That's pretty expensive grace. See, the earthquake is that most were emerging from the tomb. Matthew 27, 52. The dead were raised. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs, after His resurrection, they entered the city, and they appeared to many. You don't think that caused a stir? <laughs> I've often said the most exciting day to be on Resurrection Day, place to be on Resurrection Day will be the cemetery. Imagine some old boy out there digging a grave and all of a sudden the dead start, ra start raising. You imagine what it was like in Jerusalem that day? There was an earthquake and, and the stones were split open. The ground was shaking. The veil in the temple had torn. There's pandemonium in the temple. The sun had come dark at day, and all of a sudden you got dead people walking the streets of the city. I would say that is an attention getter right there. Can you imagine what it'd be like here on a Sunday morning if we looked up and all of a sudden some of the dead saints that had passed before us came walking in the room? You think if Jimmy Waters walked in here this morning, it'd be an attention getter? I, I, I think so. 
I think so. You think J.C. Johnson walked in here? It'd be an attention getter? Yeah, I think so. Mike Drummond hadn't been gone that long, but if Mike walks in here, he's got my attention. I can tell you that right now. I mean, the Bible says that, that when Jesus died on the cross, that, that, that the dead were raised. Some of the dead were raised. And so a lot of the tombs in and around Jerusalem to this day are hollow sepulchers resting on ground level or just above. The earthquake was evidently powerful enough to split the tombs like these. That was not the miracle. That might have occurred in any earthquake. But the great miracle is that not only were the tombs split, but those emerged from the broken tombs had been raised from the dead. Of all the writers, Matthew's the only one that, that mentions this event. Now some have said that, that, that something this significant, something this important, surely should have been recorded by all of the gospel writers. That, that, that if this were true, that, that surely all of them would have said it. And not just Matthew, the only one that, that recorded it. But there's no reason to think that this miracle was designed to catch a lot of people's attention. Now, I don't know about that. Have my attention. But it seems to have been a remarkably quiet miracle despite the spectacular nature. Matthew says many, many saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Uh, not all were. They were selective representation of a multitude of saints buried in and around Jerusalem. And the number who were raised is not specified in term. They just said many. In this case, it could refer to a dozen or even fewer. But still, despite the spectacular nature of the miracle itself, it seemed to have been a fairly low-key event. Their appearance proves something, though, that Jesus had conquered sin, but Jesus had conquered sin. Death. Amen. Let me tell you something. There'll never cease to be a time when you don't exist. You are a spiritual being. You are a spirit that inhabits a body. You're not a body that inhabits a spirit. And there's a huge difference in that. Because if you are a body that has a spirit, if we are body, what happens? Bodies die. We start dying almost as soon as we're born. Bodies die. And when a body dies, if, if the person is the body, that's devastating. But if the body is the house, if the body is the wineskin, if, if the body is the housing place of who we are, when the body dies, the spirit lives. That's why Paul says when we're absent from our body, we are present with the Lord. I like what Ramona said this morning in our prayer time. She says, I don't know how long the Lord's going to leave me around here. She said, but I know one thing. I'm going to praise him right now. And then when he calls me home, I'll still be praising him in the future. And you know, that's, that's, that's kind of the way it is, isn't it? Absent from our body, present with the Lord. And so the tombs were broken open. Uh, their appearance proved that Jesus had conquered not only sin but death for all the saints. John chapter 5 says, And one day all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. One of my favorite stories is, is Jesus with Lazarus. Jesus with Lazarus. They came to him and said, So the Lord, uh, Lazarus is sick. Jesus didn't go. Until finally word comes and it says, Lazarus has died. And the Bible says Jesus did what? He wept. He cried. And so he went to the place and, and, and he's consoling the family. And they said, well, he said, where did you lay him? Show me where you've laid him. And they said, all right, here, here's the truth. He said, roll back the stone. And so they said, well, Lord, he's been in there several days now. Uh, he's going to be ripe. He stinks. <laughs> he said, go ahead and roll the stone back. And Jesus stood outside that tomb. Amen. 
and he said three words, Lazarus, come forth. And all of a sudden, a body that had begun to decay, a brain that had stopped functioning, a heart that had stopped beating, lungs that had stopped expanding, all of a sudden that body came to life. And that brain began to work, and the heart began to beat, and the lungs began to expand, and the muscles got tension, and, and the muscles had strength, and that which was dead rose back to life. Amen. Friend, there's coming a day when God's going to call your name. And when God calls your name, all who are in the graves will hear his voice and will come forth. So Jesus says it's finished. The sun goes dark. The veil of the temple splits from top to bottom. The ground begins to shake. The, the graves are split open. The dead are raised. But then the centurion was gloriously saved. The most dramatic miracle I believe that occurred at the moment of Jesus' death was not when the sun went dark, was not when the veil was torn, was not when the ground shook, was not even when the dead came back to life. The most dramatic miracle that happened that day was the centurion charged with overseeing the crucifixion of Jesus got saved. Here we see the gospel fleshed out. No fitting conclusion could God have put on this whole event to prove John 3.16 to be true. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever, a centurion who put his son to death, that whosoever would believe on him would have eternal life. You see, at Christ's atoning work was brought to, com to completion. Its dynamic saving power was already at work in the lives of those who were physically closest to him. Look at Matthew 27, 54. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jerusalem, over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became frightened and said, Truly, this is the Son of God. A Roman centurion, a commander of a hundred-man division, the 100-man division was the basic building block of the Roman army. There were about 25 legions in the entire Roman army worldwide. Each legion consisted of 6,000 men divided into 10 cohorts of 600 men. Each cohort had three mandibles, and each mandible was divided into two centuries. Each century was com uh, commanded by a centurion, and the centurions were usually career officers. They're usually hardened to war. Death is not anything that they're unfamiliar with. And because of this particular office, he was the one that was guarding Jesus. It appears that he's the very one who'd been given charge over so overseeing the crucifixion, carrying out uh, the crucifixion of Jesus and the two thieves. He and his men were eyewitnesses. They were at the foot of the cross. The Bible says they're casting lots. They're, they're gambling for his garments there. And as they're involved in all of this, they personally kept him under guard from that point forward and then watched. They watched the trial. They had seen his silence while he was falsely accused. These same soldiers slapped him in the face, strapped him to a scourging post, and watched him suffer that horrible beating with grace and majesty. They had miraculously and mercilessly taunted him, dressing him in a faded soldier's tunic, pretending it was a royal robe. They were the same soldiers who had woven a crown of thorns and they mashed them down upon his head. 
and they spat upon him and taunted him and mistreated him in every conceivable fashion. And until now, the uniqueness of Christ had no apparent impact whatsoever on these soldiers. They were hardened men. And Jesus' passivity made no difference to the way that they treated him. His obvious innocence had gained in, uh, no sympathy from them. And they showered him with no mercy. They were professional soldiers. They'd done it a hundred times. It was another day at the office for them. They were doing what they had always done. To them, it's just another day. It's, it's, it's another execution. It's another crucifixion. It, it, it's, it's putting in their time. It's drawing their paychecks. And so they dutifully nailed Jesus' hands and feet to the cross. They set it upright. They dropped it in the hole to prepare it. They cast lots for his garments. And then they sat and they watched. But this death was unlike any death they'd ever seen before. Hundreds of times they had sat at that place. Hundreds of times they had seen them die. Hundreds of times they had helped them die. But this death, this death was different. They heard him pray for his killers. Never had they heard that. They saw the noble way in which he suffered. They heard him cry out to his father. And in the midst of all of this, they experienced three full hours of supernatural darkness. And when that darkness was followed by an earthquake at the very moment of Christ's death, the soldiers could no longer ignore the fact that Christ was the Son of the living God. Mark suggests that there was something about the way Jesus cried out that struck the centurion as supernatural. Perhaps it was the volume of his cry coming from someone that was so weak. In chapter 15, verse 39, it says, When the centurion who was standing in front of him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Matthew tells us it was also an earthquake coming at the exact moment of the final cry that finally convinced the centurion and the soldiers that Jesus was the Son of God. In verse 54 it says, And when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, Truly this is the Son of God. Notice that Matthew indicates that all of the soldiers had the same reaction. When the earthquake came. They were afraid. Using a Greek word combination that, spring, that speaks of extreme alarm. That's the, the same expression Matthew used to recount how the three disciples reacted at the Mount of Tr Transfiguration when Jesus' glory was unveiled. You ever thought about that? What that must have been like on the Mount of Transfiguration? And all of a sudden, Jesus in the flesh is transformed in front of their very eyes. Do you think that was a little spooky? Do you think that would have shook you up just a little bit? The same expression is used here by Matthew. When Christ's glory uh, was revealed when he died on the cross... It's a kind of fear that was a typical reaction of people who realized the truth about who Jesus was. And when the soldiers around the cross heard Jesus' exclamation, saw him die, and then immediately fell to the earth, it, it suddenly became all too clear to them that they had just killed the Son of the living God. And they were stricken with sheer terror. Uh-oh. What did we just do? What have we just done? This was an ordinary day. It was, a, it was a usual day for us. I mean, we've been through this routine hundreds of times and we've seen hundreds of, of criminals die. We, we've seen hundreds put to death. But we've never seen anything like this. 
The sun was dark for three hours as he hung on the cross. They tell us the veil of the temple has been, been torn. The earth is trembling underneath our feet. Rocks are splitting all around. And they're talking about dead people walking the streets of the city. What have we done? This guy must be who he said he was, the Son of God. It wasn't merely the earthquake they were afraid of. Rather, they were terrified by the sudden realization that Jesus was innocent, and not merely innocent, but that he was precisely who he claimed to be. They had killed the Son of God. And the centurion remembered the indictment of the Sanhedrin, having witnessed the death up close from beginning to end, and he rendered his own verdict. Truly, this is the Son of God. The words were evidently a true expression of faith. Luke says, He glorified God, saying, Truly, this is a righteous man. So the centurion and his soldiers with him were evidently the first converts to Christ after the resurrection, come to faith at the moment that he died. The next time you're tempted to be pushed over the cliff in discouragement and in depression. You just need to remember whose you are. You need to remember who you belong to. And I love that song that we sang, If God is for us, who can stand against us? And friend, I'm going to tell you, if there's something the church needs to hear today, it's that, is that we serve a risen God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, who is sovereign, that has a plan and a purpose for our life, has a plan and purpose for His bride, His church. He is, he is preparing the time of His coming. And in spite of all that's going on around us in the world that we see today, and I'm telling you, it can be depressing. Sometimes you just need to turn the news off and you need to open your Bible. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen. And the fact that the risen sovereign Lord, the wonderful thing is that Jesus just didn't die on the cross and, and that wasn't the end of it. The Bible says that three days later he came crashing out of the tomb in all power, in all glory, in victory over sin, death, and the grave. And as a child of his, you have that same victory too. Pray with me. Father, we praise you today and we worship you for sending your Son, Jesus, the Son of God, the sinless Lamb, to die for our sins. And I pray today, God, that you will speak to our hearts. Maybe, maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. You don't know the Lord. You've never given your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. Friend, everything I talked about today, Jesus did so that you could have eternal life, so that you could be forgiven of all of your sin. Today, all you have to do is call upon the Lord. If there's a restlessness, if there's a stirring in your heart, I want to tell you what that is. That's God the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that no one can come to the Father unless the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, draws them. And so that's the Spirit of God doing a work in your life. He's drawing you. And, and the opportunity for you to receive forgiveness and mercy and grace is before you today. And if you've never trusted Jesus and you want to trust Him today, you can trust Him right there where you sit. You can pray this prayer. Dear God, I'm a sinner. And thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. Thank you that He paid the price for all that I've done and all that I've refused to do. And today I ask you to forgive me 
of my sins, to wash me clean inside and out, to fill me with your spirit and your presence, and change my life. I surrender my life to you to use for your glory and your honor. Now, if you prayed that prayer this morning, I'd like to pray for you. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to ask no one to look around right now. But you say, Pastor, I prayed that today. I, I surrendered my life to Christ. I'm not going to embarrass you or anything, but I, I just want to know if I can pray for you. Would you slip a hand up and pull it right back down? Anywhere in here? Father, I thank you for hands that signify hearts. And I thank you, Father, for your work of redemption. And I pray today that you will have your way in our hearts and in our lives. I pray that you'll move and that you'll use us in, in the world to reflect Christ. And so I pray today that you make yourself real to these people. I pray for our church, God, that we would be light in a dark world, that we'd be salt in a decaying world, and that we would preserve the truth in what we say and what we do. And I pray for those here today that are searching for a church to belong to. If this is the place you have for them, Father, I pray you draw them today and that they'd know. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing. If you're one of the ones that prayed with me, uh, Rob and, and Bobby are going to be standing here. And, and what, as we sing, if you were serious about what you did, would you just come to Bobby or Rob and just say, I prayed with the pastor. And we have some people that will talk with you and pray with you. We want to give you some stuff that will help you as you begin your walk with Christ. Others of us here today are Christians. Uh, we're getting ready to, to enter into to Easter here in a couple of weeks where we celebrate uh, the risen Lord. Are you salt in an unsavored world, a decaying world? Are you light in a dark world? And then there's others of us here that are searching for a church to belong to. We'd like to invite you to come. If you'd like to know what it means to be a member here, join our church. Just come to Bobby or Rob as we sing. Say, hey, we want to know what, what, what it means to be a member here at Mabel White. Now, Father, I thank you today for the good news of the gospel. Lord, that it's the power of God unto salvation. And we pray today, God, that you will have your way in our hearts and in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand together and we sing, and you come as, as God speaks to you. All that I am, all that I have, I lay them down before you.
I'm 